For years, there's been this strange distaste for business. People kept thinking business was bad and business owners were greedy and money grubbers. But the truth is, business is and can be a huge force for good. Business can change lives, communities, and countries. Business isn't the enemy. Business can change the world. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of stillbeingmolly.com. And this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, a CEO, community leader, or just all around amazing person who's trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their professional career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact right where you are. My guests this week are Nick Barije and Greg Urquhart of Karasimbi Business Partners. What Nick and Greg are doing at Karasimbi Business Partners is incredibly unique, and their approach to helping entrepreneurs in Rwanda is amazing. I know you're going to love this conversation. So without further ado, on to my conversation with Nick and Greg. Greg and Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. to be here. Thanks for having me. I am, I mean, one, I was thinking before the show, how awesome is technology that the three of us are literally in three different time zones across the world and yet we're able to communicate this way? I just think if I was like when I was a kid growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, and somebody ever told me that I could talk through a computer to different people across the world, I really would have thought that they were making up some crazy, like futuristic, in, you know, invention that was in some sci-fi movie. Because this is just amazing. It is incredible. It's actually technology is my background, uh, and I spend a lot of time, even these days, talking to to folks around artificial intelligence and things <laughs> like this. And you just would never have predicted, even ten years ago, that we'd be doing this. Much less what's to come. So it yeah. is incredible. Yeah. So how about you, Nick? I look back to when mobile phone technology was introduced. It, it, it's amazing how far technology has advanced. I, yeah, it's, it's something I'm still trying to get to grips with. Yes. So, the team, the team in, in the office was teasing me today how often I've done podcasts, and I'm telling them, yeah, this is, this is, this is really new. It That's is. That's how far we are coming. It is. So Nick uh, Barije, he is uh, coming to us all the way from Kigali, Rwanda. And Greg Urquhart, he is in California. Where in California are you, Greg? I'm outside the Bay Area. So. Oh, I went to San Francisco a few years ago, and I love that area. It's so beautiful. And yeah, so anyway, so here I am in Durham, North Carolina. We are bringing everybody together. I am so excited to talk to you guys for lots of reasons. But one, your business and uh, Karasimbi biz- uh, Business Partners, you guys do something that is so incredible and so unique. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your stories. So before we get really into all of that, I like to get to know my guests a little bit more. So um, I'm going to have each of you, Greg and Nick, I'm going to have each of you tell your story, your, your Greg and Nick 101. So Nick, I'm actually going to have you kick it off. And I would like for you just to share your story and tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, obviously you're living in Rwanda. So tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're, where you're from and, and how you got to where you are today. And then Greg will uh, kick it off to you. Okay. Th- th- thank you, Maury. I was born outside Rwanda. I was born in Uganda. First time I came to Rwanda was in 1996. And uh, that, that's when my parents moved back from Uganda to, to live in, in Rwanda. I went to school in Rwanda. I did my college in, at the University of Rwanda. Finished my college and started working in Rwanda to, uh, around 2004. I've been living in Rwanda since then. I'm married with uh, two young kids, eight, eight-year-old boy and uh, a five-year-old girl. Interestingly, I met Greg as a client in 2011, and uh, by then I was working as the CFO of uh, the largest milk dairy plant in Rwanda. And uh, it's at the time when we had just commissioned the plant and uh, we are having some struggles on how to, to make this business feasible. And uh, it's the first time I met Greg. It's the first time I was getting introduced to Karisimi. I was intrigued by, by their passion, by the zeal that they had in trying to understand the business and, and trying to work with us to see how we could improve this business. 
one thing that really struck me, which I felt was the DNA of Karisimbi, was their ability to look at a business and appreciate it as if they are owners of the business. And that, that's something very unique that most consultants usually don't have. Is they, they look at, uh, at company intervention as if to say we are, we are giving you recommendations, but we are leaving them up to you to implement. The difference between normal consultants and Karisimbi is, is really that. So that was my first interaction with Greg, and uh, I've, I've known them since then. I joined Karisimbi three years ago after having worked with uh, an in one of the largest investment funds in Rwanda for eight years, and I felt there was more that I could contribute to what Karisimbi is doing. That's amazing. I just think that it's, it was clearly such a, like, divine meeting of you guys that you guys were able to connect. Uh, so, Greg, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and all about for, you know, people that are obviously unfamiliar with Karasimbi business partners, you know, what you guys do and what your business model is. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's it's very interesting. So back in 2009, um, I have two and it's very important that I, I highlight this of two partners that started Karasimbi Business Partners. So Dana Jakanovic and Carter Crockett as well, very active uh, in the business. And so they were co-founders uh, with me originally. And actually, it was their idea. They're longtime friends. We had known each other, but they had known each other a long time got together around that time and said, you know, we really want to do something that is going to be uh, impactful in, in the enterprise because they're business guys and could do something that's going to be uh, have social good impact and do something in the in the developing world in a place where uh, there's a lot of potential need. And they reached out to me because my background, I've been in technology for quite a long time, had worked for Microsoft for many years in the U.S. and in Europe. And when I was based in Europe, I had responsibility for Africa. So I was in Africa quite a bit over a, a, a lot of years. Every quarter I was traveling around and uh, working, doing business there. So they had started to put together a plan around what would it look like to do a business incubator in Africa, doing a lot of due diligence on where should it be placed and so forth. And so they'd written up a prospectus and because we were good friends, had reached out to me just to get my input on it. And at that time, I was still within Microsoft, uh, you know, an executive there and was at a turning point in my career where I'd been working back in the U.S. for quite a while and was having discussions with the company around potentially moving to Canada and leading a group there or back to Europe. And I just had this real sort of troubling sense around, is this, is this it? Is this exactly what I'm supposed to be doing at this point? Um, and so as they sent this prospectus over and I read it, I found myself really sort of poking holes on it, being very critical around, hey, whether I thought this would work or you're going to re need to rethink this, et cetera. And I remember them sort of joking with me like, hey, you know, take it easy. We just wanted your – a little bit of opinion. You're, you're being pretty harsh on it. And I think at the time, I didn't even realize why I was being so harsh on it until I started talking to my wife about, this is crazy what they're planning to do. And then as I thought about it further, I thought, and why not? Why not do that? And so I came back to him with my feedback and saying also, hey, how would you feel about um, me joining you? Which uh, fortunately, they said, you know, they thought that would be fantastic. So with our three families, we started really getting serious about where we were going to go. And Rwanda, Contrary to the belief of a lot of Westerners, they have this perspective of, oh, they've seen Hotel Rwanda and think of it as this very dangerous mm -hmm. place. People say, how could you go there? Yeah. You don't know that Rwanda is the safest, cleanest, um, easiest place to do business, probably almost on the entire continent. It has the lowest corruption, uh, fastest to be able to create and start a business. Wow. As foreigners coming into the country, you're able to have full ownership of your business if that's the model you want to take, full ownership of land, property, and so forth. Very different from other places. And going over there with a family, you know, safety and things like that are important. And you are safer in Kigali than you would be in Detroit or Chicago or some some other city like that in the U.S. People don't realize that. So it's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful place. It is. F fast, fast growth and so forth. So yeah, we, we uh, came over with the idea of starting a management consulting company because again, 
we all have a strong faith, and so our Christian faith said, hey, go help the poor, the middle, widow, and the orphan, but we weren't missionaries, um, and we knew how to help businesses. And so to Nick's point, I think what was a real success and a real focus for us was we were fully moving there, in a sense, burning the boats as entrepreneurs, not flying in as consultants to do a few projects here and there, right. but living full-time. And that made a real quick difference in the companies that we would talk with. And as Nick mentioned, he was a client. And so here we have this brilliant guy involved in a lot of different businesses when he was with the investment firm and being set up as MD of these different groups. And we were able to dive in really deeply. And as he said, have a mindset of if this were my business, what would I do? And not only here are my recommendations, but let's work together over the next several years to get things done. That's amazing that you guys were able to combine these unique talents, you were able to really be driven by your faith. Um, you know, I'm a Christian as well. And so that's something that drives me every day in my business. And and just to see people who are willing to say, you know what, we're going to not just, you know, live this out in our lives, but we're going to also make a career of this, of, of really making a positive impact. Um, for people that maybe don't know, can you give just kind of a quick you know, like a very surface level explanation of what a business incubator is um, for somebody that maybe is like, okay, this sounds, I think I understand, but you know, for, for somebody who's listening that maybe doesn't know exactly what that looks like or how that works, or, you know, when you say Greg was a, um, or sorry, Nick was a client, you know, what, what exactly did that look like? Well, um, I'll give an overview of the business incubator, but we actually ended up moving away from that. And I'll tell you why for a couple of reasons. So a business incubator is the idea of being able to work with entrepreneurs or small existing businesses to help them literally incubate the idea and start to be more attractive to bring in investment or even just to get loans from a bank and so forth and be involved with them in a way that helps them think through how they're going to do sales, how they're going to do hiring, how they're going to do supply chain and so forth. Because in theory, we're able to, the incubator is able to bring those areas of expertise that often no single business owner would have. Now, when we started evaluating that and talking with government leaders and so forth within Rwanda, we realized frankly, that would be a hard model for us to be able to be sustainable ourselves. We did not want to be an NGO, nothing against NGOs, but we didn't want to be in the business of raising donor funds in order to be able to do these this business help. Mm -hmm. So we switched to a model of uh, management consulting where we could go in and say, look, there will be fees involved, but we will be very reasonable in how we put those out to any sort of business. And we wanted to make it a way where we were able to, their success was our success, that when they saw growth in their business, that, that we would be able to continue working with them. They would be able to pay for those services and so forth. Um, the interesting thing with that model, as we started to get clients with small projects, such as providing a full business plan for them, able to map out the three to five year future for them. In addition to plans, we will help them with getting finance, getting securing loans from banks to be able to grow the business. Often they were looking at expanding within the, the region. And additionally, we had very strong relationships with government and various leaders in business and industry, everything from the, the healthcare sector, the agricultural sector is very important there. And they had their own view of industries that were really important to the country where they had premier or marquee companies that were struggling. And so one of the first projects that we did, and this is when we early started even interacting with Nick as a client, was looking across the country at these various industries and getting an assignment where we were going to do a deep intervention with about 12 different businesses to deeply evaluate them and then look at what would be the get healthy plan, so to speak, that would help them to turn around and grow. That was one of the most exciting and most difficult things that we had done. Yeah, We, we were able to help some businesses really completely turn around. And I'll say one of the other ancillary benefits that came out of that is we identified a lot of areas where there was true opportunity within the country and businesses almost didn't even exist yet to take advantage of it. So Karasimbi Business Partners actually now has invested in and even helped build out entirely separate businesses in areas like uh, cosmetics oil processing. So a factory in Kigali works with hundreds of farmers around Rwanda into Uganda, uh, Burundi, and so forth. 
and has you know marquee clients like the Body Shop UK. Oh wow! And and so that's an entirely separate business that Karasimbi was able to it, through their work in the agricultural sector identify that need and work with financial partners to build that up over time. Um, we also have an accounting services business. We saw this need where we were consulting with companies and found that it was very difficult for them to manage their finances appropriately or be able to handle taxes, which is a very serious uh, scenario in Rwanda. It's very confusing often to new business owners coming in. And so we were able to purchase in with another partner into an accounting services firm that can do tax preparation, bookkeeping, et cetera, for small businesses in Rwanda. So that's an entirely separate business as well that built out of that consulting business. And we're able to now run profitably and provide you know additional employment and so forth. I think that's absolutely amazing. Nick, I would love to hear from you as, um, you know, as a director with Karasimbi and somebody who, you know, you've you've got this just amazing resume um, and just you're just you have this incredible resume of all this work that you've done. You know, when you when you got connected with Greg and as you saw an opportunity here, especially um, you saw an opportunity to fulfill a need in Rwanda. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit about that and what that what that looked like and what made you say, you know what, this is really an opportunity I want to be a part of. And also, if you can kind of, you know, you know, as Greg was saying earlier about how Rwanda is just a great place to do business. But what are some of the both the, you know, the things that make it a great place to do business, but also some of the challenges that you face and, and how Kerasim Business Partners is able to, to kind of come in and fill that gap. At the time I, I met with, I, I started engaging with Kerasim as a client. Like Greg mentioned, part of what we, we've we seen and, and from the time Kerasim came on the market is uh, Rwanda was at that stage in its development where the private sector was in its infancy and uh, it, it really called for anchor investors, like the investment firm that I was working for. Companies that would be able to raise sufficient capital and deploy it most often in startup or greenfield projects, something that hadn't yet been done before. But most of these businesses were being led by Rondis, because this was at, at a time when most foreigners, like Greg mentioned, had these perceptions about Rwanda. But one thing that the Rwandese did not have in most, most often were the, the management expertise to, to run the businesses. So when we started engaging with Kari Simbi as a client, that, that's the situation that we were in. Is we have funds, we've been able to raise funds and deploy it to start a business, but we don't have the management expertise now to operationalize the business. How do we move the business from infancy to growth. Working with Karisimbi as a client, I think uh, in my fair, in my former company, I, I was among the rising stars and uh, the secret to my success was that each time I would, get, I would get moved to a different business. Most often, and this is something that Greg would speak to, having worked with Karisimbi in 2011, come up with this super strategic turnaround plan for the business that I was leading, for each position that I would go to, for each company that I would go to manage, I would always call in Kari Simbi to help me do a diagnostics of the, of the company and then together work together to identify ways of growth. So this really, it, it sort of catapulted my, my, my career from... CFO to CEO of, of different companies in Rwanda. And for each of these companies that I would go to, I would always call in Kari Simbi to come and either do a business plan for me or do a strategic plan for me. Now, it reaches a time where you feel like you are the pin, at the pinnacle of your career and then you are beginning to ask yourself, but what have I learned? And this was the attraction for me to move into Kari Simbi, is I realized that the the challenges I had as a CEO, as a, as a CFO, it shared, it shared across Rwanda. It was not something unique to me. It's something that, is, that cuts across the different sectors of our economy. So I felt now joining Karisimbi with my 
work experience leading businesses in Rwanda. It would make us as a firm continuously add value. Like Greg said, we are, we are not only consultants, we are investors. But this time we're also telling to clients, look, we've also run businesses in Rwanda. We've, we've been in this situation. This was the attraction for me. And also having that need to say, for this far that I've come, I want to see others equally grow in their careers, working together with Karisimi. Now, to the question that you ask, what challenges do we see as a firm? Key among them that still exist in Rwanda is uh, there aren't many skilled, highly competent managers to run businesses. Yeah. So that's, that's what we, that's our aspirations as, as a firm, continually support businesses in Rwanda into growth, continually work with business managers in Rwanda to, to grow and also enable them to impart, impart those skills to them that, that we have as a farm. The uniqueness of our farm is that uh, we are quite a, di- a diversified team. We have expatriates from the US, from, from Canada, from UK, working with locals in Rwanda, and this is really where our, our strengths lie. Well, that was actually going to be my follow-up question, is what are the typical types of businesses that you guys work with? Are these going to be larger, you know, almost like smaller corporations in Rwanda? Or are they, you know, everything from, you know, kind of the the mom and pop, you know, general store on the corner <laughs> in the town, you know, to, to something that's maybe a little bit larger? What do, what do the businesses typically look like that you guys work with? Now, one thing that we've identified as a firm is we, 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 we proudly call ourselves journalists for one single reason that in Rwanda, the, the sectors are so diverse. You, you can't say that we're going to be specialists in the, in the health sector. We're going to be specialists in, in, uh, in services sector. The, the businesses aren't, aren't many and they aren't large. And mm-hmm. as a result of that, we've, we, we, we cut across different sectors. We have, we've advised companies that are into construction, which is one of the, of the ever-growing sectors in Rwanda. We've worked with companies that are into tourism. We've worked with financial services, providers, insurance companies. So they, we are not limited to a sector. We, 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 we believe that uh, most often the challenges to businesses is not sector-specific. So the, the, the approach to, to, to our way of working is to advise clients irrespective of the sector, especially that given that we have really a diversified pool of, of consultants in-house and also we've built a strong pool of, of associates that we can pull in if there is a need for a sector-specific skill. I know you are loving this chat with Nick and Greg, but I want to thank our sponsor of the show who is able to help make the show possible, and that is CauseBox. You know my love for CauseBox, my favorite ethical quarterly subscription box that I've been a member of for over two and a half years. CauseBox is curating the best products that do the most good. In each seasonal box, you'll find everything from fashion accessories, homewares, and jewelry to the best skincare and wellness products. And not only are the products made by some of my favorite companies, oftentimes CauseBox actually collaborates with these companies to make exclusive products just for their seasonal box. These are limited edition things that you cannot get anywhere else. The products are not just beautiful, they're also useful. And each box delivers amazing value with a guarantee of over $150 worth of products for only $54.95 or $39.95 if you use my gift code Molly. And best of all, the impact of each cause box makes the whole membership even more worth it. Their upcoming spring box, for example, employed more than 600 artisans under fair trade conditions in India and Kenya and put 100 young girls in India through school. Go to stillbeingmolly.com slash cause box and use the coupon code Molly for $15 off. Now back to my conversation with Nick and Greg. Greg, what has been your experience, you know, as you guys have really you know, kind of honed in on what, you know, what works and what doesn't and, and how have you guys really kind of streamlined everything to, to make sure that you are really serving, 
you know, your clients and serving these businesses in the, the best way possible? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and I'd say in extending Nick's answer, as he represented that it was important, we describe ourselves as generalists. And that's important because we do have an opportunity to work across sector. I'd say, you know, th the answer is the secret is being able to talk at every level of the business. And so I think that was a strength when we originally started it. So Carter, Dano and myself coming over, we were a unique blend of different skills. So I'll give you just a quick thumbnail view. So Dano was West Point grad for those, you know, listening to, you know, that, you know, the military academy, very difficult to get into, very disciplined, uh, went from there into, he was in the military. He was uh, army ranger. He went to Johns Hopkins, did a, a, a dual, you know, international studies and finance, worked at large scale corporations like AT&T, was CEO of the construction company as well, and did all the project management, uh, et cetera, for that. And so then you have Carter, who was complete entrepreneur. I had worked with him, knew him through university, but also worked with him a bit at Microsoft. He did other technology startups. He went and got his doctorate in entrepreneurship. He taught at the university level. And then you had myself who runs you know, large sales teams, a lot in the uh, hiring arena, how to run pipelines and think about forecasting and so forth, uh, as well as marketing. And so when we go into a business and we have now, you know, professionals like Nick leading us and we have senior managers from all various parts of the world, as well as very important to have local Africans who understand the context, have been educated in the in the region, understand the businesses as well. We go in and, and start with the view of what is that long term business plan? What is your hiring plan? How are you going to manage sales? Let's look at the way you're thinking about the strategy of it, how are you going to market your business and so forth. So being able to hit every touch point that a business needs and come in with expertise. Again, as Nick mentioned, you know, the private sector really growing that we were a very and are a very unique firm being able to hit on all of those and be very holistic in our conversations with these companies and our commitment to be, hey, we want to deliver you a, uh, something that is going to be meeting the needs of the project, but we want to stay with you over the years. And so we're very proud to say that we have repeat clients in sectors, you know, where we've done four and five projects with them over the, you know, eight to nine years now that we've been working with them, uh, which is a real testament to the type of work we're doing and that value of being able to say whatever the area of the business where you, you have questions or you want to explore, uh, we're going to be able to work with you. That's so cool. I, you know, this isn't a topic that I, I talk about a lot, both in, you know, on this podcast and on my blog and uh, just in my general life, I can get on a soapbox real quickly about this. But I think, you know, when people talk about this, especially Westerners and, you know, Greg, I know you understand this and Nick, I'm sure you get this as well as just like, Westerners like to think that the answer to alleviating poverty is to come in and to be this, you know, have this savior complex and to be like, oh, we're going to start this charity and we're going to, you know, just give these handouts and we're going to just we're going to fix everything and we're going right. to make it, you know, Americanized and we're going to teach them how we do things. When that's actually like that is not even close to the solution. In fact, that can a lot in a lot of cases take things backwards and instead, you know, creating economic opportunities and creating um, a ripple effect through sustainable businesses and giving people the opportunity. You know, sometimes it's, it's just a matter of you have somebody in a small community who has an absolutely brilliant idea that could completely change the landscape of their community, their, you know, their region, their country, they just don't necessarily have access to the resources to be able to implement that idea or maybe they don't have access to you know the financial support or maybe they've got the financial support but then they don't have you know necessarily like you were saying like everything from and and that's the same thing here too everything from taxes to the to the the little nitty-gritty 
parts of running a business that can be so challenging for people, you know, to just give somebody that opportunity to to have those resources or to, to learn those skills and be able to implement them. Those are the types of things that long term, that is what alleviates poverty. That is what alleviates, um, you know, trouble, in, troubles in the world. I mean, in, in community. And this is a, you know, this is something that it doesn't matter whether you're the, in the United States or in Rwanda or in China. It doesn't matter where you are. The fact is, is that, you know, these are the things that that create sustainability and and really change generations. That's right. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't agree more. And that's been always our motivation to have, as they say, you know, the triple bottom line. And when we have board meetings, et cetera, we're always looking and evaluating at what impact is this having on you know, our own employees, of which, you know, we're, we're very proud of the fact that we are a, you know, a net employer. And when we look across the businesses, it ranges anywhere from, you know, a few hundred to several hundred people that are employed at one point or another on any given year. And then beyond that, as we think about some of the like the agricultural investments we've made, et cetera, you know, we've got thousands of families whose lives have been positively impacted. And that was the whole reason for us doing this. There's so much more to life than running a business and making money. And Nick has that motivation. We all have that that motivation of the whole reason we're here, we're in this part of the world, which by the way, it's not to say, oh, you know, the poor folks in Rwanda or in Africa, Mm -hmm. it is one of the most exciting places in the entire world to be. The ideas coming out of there, the opportunity for growth on a business perspective and just more generally the resources there is phenomenal. Uh, And I'd say even in areas like technology, you know, we were joking about that earlier, that uh, the mobile technology and things like that Africa and a place like that is taking the best and the most recent and going straight to that. Yes. Like they don't even, a great example, the entire time, you know, living there, don't call a landline. Whereas in the West, you know, we're, we're getting there now where people mostly do mobile. Some people still, you know, you call a business, you're calling a landline. Not true in Africa. Why do that? Why go to that old technology? And so a lot of the the projects and things like that that we're working on, uh, Kigali and Rwanda, you know, we were, we were very involved in some projects there as they, groups like Carnegie Mellon, which is arguably one of the top five computer science schools in the world, has a full graduate program based in Rwanda, only place on the entire continent. They picked Rwanda for a reason. It was the most forward thinking, had the broadest, biggest vision you know, they often say they want to be the Singapore of Africa and really be a mm. knowledge-based economy. And yeah. so, again, for us, as a management consulting business that really wants to bring in those great business practices that work internationally, but with all these experts like Nick and, and others on the team that are African and know the context and know the region and know the people and understand what's going to work, it just has been a great blend. And I think it's a real secret to our success. That's absolutely amazing. Nick, I would, and, and I don't know, maybe this question's better for Nick, maybe it's better for Greg. Um, I would love if, if one of you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, maybe a, a, an example or a story of a particular client or a particular business that you guys have worked with um, and really saw through the whole process and, and you know, maybe, you know, just a, a, an amazing success story that just kind of gives people an illustration of what it looks like to really work with somebody from the beginning and see them through the process and, and see the, you know, the fruits of their labor. Nick, I think you should talk maybe about one of the, cons- in the construction space, you've done, we've done a lot of pretty interesting things that have changed business there. Yeah. The, 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 it, interestingly, it, it, it's the example I wanted to give. When uh, in 2014, I was uh, the the managing director of, of uh, a local construction company in Rwanda. It, it's the largest in Rwanda. And uh, when I was appointed as the marketing as the managing director, the question I had was, how do we grow the, this this company that started as a, as a company that was doing potholes in Chigali? That is that was in 2011, in, in 2014, now doing, a, d- doing tarmac roads in, in Chigali and outside Chigali. So we called in Karisimbi Business Partners and we said, look, we want to, to work with us to define our next five years. Can we prepare together the strategic plan 
for for this roads construction company. And uh, during the the engagement, Curry Simba was able to identify certain areas of growth. For example, most 90% of our business then was coming from the government of Rwanda. And then Curry Simba was able to ask us, the, the, the team that we're engaging with, why don't you consider bidding for international projects, projects funded by 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 donors like World Bank and African Development Bank. And we had never asked ourselves this question. And, and, and we started saying, what do we need to do to make sure that we do? Today, if, if you read the Rwanda's only daily newspaper, in t- today's story, there is a story of this company forming a joint venture with an international company to do one of the largest ADB-funded projects. Wow. In 2011, before we started working with Tarisimbi, this was a dream. 2018, just less than four years later, this company has taken on international pro- projects. It's, it's, it has formed joint ventures. It has worked with companies and bid on projects funded by the World Bank, by the Japanese government, by African Development Bank. I was reading it's the largest roads project that is being done in Rwanda, in, since Rwanda's independence. And this company is now in position of doing such a project. So that, that's an example of, of some of the companies that Karisimi has worked with, provided recommendations of areas of growth, and we've seen companies take them on, and these companies have grown. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, what a, I just think that like you were saying, you know, like in 2007, this was a dream. And to be able to see that, you know, a company that, you know, started from, you know, had this, this small dream, this small vision, but, or it was a, you know, a big dream, a big vision. And to see that come to fruition, that's, that's absolutely incredible and amazing. And like I said, that those are the types of things that, they have such a ripple effect and they have such um, uh, just a lasting and massive impact on families, on communities and um, and, you know, and Rwanda and now on the world because you're you know, you're working internationally and, um, you know, just really going across uh, country country lines and and all of that. So that's just that's absolutely incredible. Thank you for sharing that, Nick. I really appreciate that. So as we kind of transition here to the end, um, I have just absolutely loved hearing both of you share your story and share your hearts for um, for business and and seeing the positive impact that business can have. And um, you know, this is like I said, this is something that I love to talk about because. You know, for a while there was the, this this trend here. You know, at least in America, where it was almost like business was a bad thing, and I never understood that, and I never understood why people mm-hmm. were anti business. And I'm thinking to myself, like, without business, like, where where do we go? And so to hear people who who are taking um, or not only just making business have a positive impact, but really flipping it, flipping it on its head and and making it mission driven and having that social good component and really like you were saying, Greg, you know, making it not just about at the end of the day, turning a profit, but how can we really, you know, make an impact and how can we really change lives through business? Um, so as we transition here to the end, um, I would just love for you guys to kind of share with us. I like to get to know my guests, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, kind of on a fun level. Um, and, you know, obviously you guys are both Greg and Nick, you guys are incredibly smart, incredibly intelligent. You you work crazy hard. Um, I would love for you guys just to share with our audience, what's something that you guys really, you know, enjoy to do for fun? Um, you know, are you reading anything uh, lately that, that you want people to check out or maybe watching something uh, that you want people to check out or just kind of tell us a little bit, you know, what do you guys do for fun uh, when you're not working? Yeah, that's funny. You know, I um, I didn't mention, I guess, in my intro. So I have four children. Oh, yeah. And, so you're busy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a busy life. Um, Lots of animals. My mu- my wife is a huge animal lover, so I, I always say I live on a sort of hobby farm. There's <laughs> horses and oh chickens goodness. and goats and rabbits and turtles and fish and dogs and cats and you name it, we've we've got it. Wow. Uh, my my youngest son is Rwandan. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, when we were there. My wife 
as soon as we got there was like, hey, I, I really want to be having an impact as well. You're working on the business stuff. I've got our other kids were young, but old enough to be going to school. And so she had time. So she started working at uh, an orphanage locally there run by the Sisters of Charity, Mother Teresa's Order. Wow. You know, it was a great experience. And uh, with no plans to adopt, I, I should have known better within a couple months of being there. <laughs> She had all of her favorites, and uh, you know, long story short, we ended up with a you know getting in a great relationship with my son Marcel, uh, Marceli Shimwe, and and we ended up adopting him when he was four. He's eleven now, oh, and wow. I'll say one of the funny things now. So we have just always ties to Rwanda, but you know the strongest ties possible. Actually, I partner Dano, our our colleague Dano, also has an adopted son from Ra, from Rwanda, and so uh, I love the idea of potentially you know things keep going on and. Marcel can be back in the business. My eldest daughter, who's in school and uh, at college now at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, but she is asking me already about can I do internships at at Karasimbi? I'd like to be back over in in Africa and so forth. So it's it's interesting. And I'd say one of the the funny things going on is Rwandans and Nick. If you could see Nick, you would you would understand this. They're they tend to be a tall people. And I, unfortunately, am not a tall guy, maybe 5'9", maybe 5'10", if I'm really exaggerating and put on my cowboy boots. But uh, already my son, my 11-year-old, his hands are about the size of my hands. He's like 5'4 at 11. And uh, I, I know he's going to be looking down on me soon. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a it's a great life. It's a, it's great to have this ability to be moving around sort of the world back and forth and so forth. Um, like I said, I've, we've got this scenario of I've got, I'm surrounded by animals, uh, all the time. So that's kind of one of the things that keeps us pretty busy. And, you know, on the, on the business side, being back over constantly in uh, working on helping out on the projects that we're doing in Africa is sort of just a, a passion that I don't see ever, ever going away. I, I really truly feel like it's the place where the biggest impact is going to be had. The future is is in that region and you know feel very really fortunate to be a part of it. That's amazing. That is absolutely incredible. My husband has uh, dreams of living um, on a farm. So he's, he's okay. going to be like, when he listens to this, he's going to be like, yes, see, that's what I'm talking about. We got to get our farm. Right. <laughs> You're welcome anytime. I love it. Uh, what about you, Nick? Uh, same, a little bit different from from Craig. I <laughs> I have quite a, a, a young family. Like I said, I also have an adopted son who is 23, just finished university in Rwanda. Wow. And then I have I have an eight year old son and, and a five year old daughter. Now, one of the beauties of working with Carrie Sim is the the work life balance. Something I I had not had. For the last 10 or so years that I've been working in Rwanda, I, I was always in a position where I was almost 24 hours on call because of the kind of, of, of jobs I was doing. But now with Carrie Simbi, I'm, I'm able to go and pick my five-year-old daughter from school, go home and have lunch with her, then be able to pick my eight-year-old son. So off work. One of the pleasures that I have is spending time with, with my kids because my wife is a banker and uh, banking is very time consuming. She will start her day at 8 a.m. And, and the earliest she will get home is, is, is 8 p.m. So I'm, I'm, I'm currently the one who is having to do homework with kids and uh, it's something that I've, I'm enjoying doing because at the time they were born given what I was doing in my previous jobs, I never had time for them. Something I do for fun is going for racing. I've been to Abu Dhabi to watch Formula One. I'm looking to, I'm hoping this year to go to Russia for the World Cup. Oh, wow. So I, love traveling. I, I, I love traveling in 2011. I went uh, on a tour of Europe with my wife. We went to Barcelona, we went to Amsterdam. Berlin, Rome, Paris. So that's that's really my pressure of of work, and and my kids really love it as well. It, it, during summer, as as a family, we try to go for for safari. So we've been on a safari in Nairobi. We've been on, on safari in Masai Mara, in um, Queen Elizabeth in Uganda. I I use it as an opportunity to have 
have quality time as a family, but also as a time for my kids to get to appreciate nature. Yes, I have been um, to Kenya three times. Um, I have very close connections there, and I've been on safari um, in a few places in Kenya, but uh, my favorite was actually in Nairobi National Park. Is just it's amazing because you it's this huge national park, and you see lions and you know every animal you can think of, and then all of a sudden you see the skyline of downtown Nairobi right behind all these lions and and zebras and giraffes, and it's but it's beautiful. I know what you're saying. Uh, it, yeah, I think Nairobi is so unique in that it place is. that uh, it, it's the only city that has the pressure of having a national park right in the middle of the city. Yes. I know people who live in Nairobi who, when they want to, when they feel stressed, they just go and take a, a one-hour ride in the park and they're able to go back to office. I wish we had the same in Chile. Would, it would be my past time. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I remember um, we did a sunrise safari the last time I was there. And it was just, I mean, it was just incredible to, I mean, you're literally sitting there in the middle of this national park. There's the sunrise coming up over the mountains. And then there's like a huge pack of lions, you know, right, you know, within almost reaching, you know, we could reach out of the the van and touch it. And then you just look over there and there's like skyscrapers. (laughs) It's just, it's incredible, but it's so, it's so beautiful. Um, Greg and Nick, this was just um, such a pleasure. And thank you so much for sharing everything with us. Um, I just I applaud everything that you're doing and um, I will continue to to just to share what you guys are doing and um, for the listeners I will have um, Greg and Nick's information in the show notes as well as um, you know how you guys can get connected with Karasimbi business partners and just find out more about the amazing things that they are doing and uh, like I said this was just such a pleasure thank you both so much love doing it thanks for thanks for having us I loved connecting with Greg and Nick. All three of us were on completely different parts of the world, but we are connected by a passion to help others and make a positive impact. How awesome is that? Be sure to give Greg and Nick and Karis and B Business Partners some love on social media this week. I'll have all of their links and information in the show notes. Another huge, huge, huge thank you to this week's podcast sponsor, Causebox. Visit stillbeingmolly.com slash Causebox and use the coupon code MOLLY, that's M-O-L-L-Y, for $15 off. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you are a first-time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to visit the archives for past shows featuring amazing entrepreneurs and business owners who are literally changing the world with their businesses. And if you're a regular listener of the show, thank you so much for tuning in week in and week out, and thank you for your support. Be sure to head on over to iTunes, Google Play, Radio Public, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and make sure you are subscribed to the show. Clicking that subscribe button helps to make sure that you never miss a new episode of the podcast. And while you're there, would you mind taking a moment to leave a review? Leaving a review helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. And if you share the show on social media, be sure to use the hashtag business with purpose podcast or tag me at still being Molly on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. This show is edited by my amazing husband and executive producer, John Stillman. And the music is by Mark Killian of third wheel media. Thank you so much for listening. Now go do something good with purpose on purpose. <laughs>